Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of our seminar series is, as always, to bring the mechanochemistry community together. The seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern and are available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. Shown here are our previous speakers. All of these seminars are available again to watch on the YouTube channel. We also have a great group of speakers planned for the upcoming months and hope that you will join us for all of them. A few quick thanks. Thanks to uh, Dr. James Batiste, the center's director, Jennifer Belsick, the center's administrative coordinator, and two CMCC students without whom this seminar would not be possible, Quintarius Moore and Katie Floyd. Uh, please do continue to follow us, uh, follow us on the YouTube channel, and also keep up to date with our, our progress on Twitter. A few quick guidelines, reminder that the seminar is being recorded. Should you have any questions, please do either email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com, or you can post them directly into the YouTube channel. Either way, they will be propagated to the speaker at the end of the seminar. Last but not least, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Francisca Emerling. Dr. Emerling is the head of the Department of Materials Chemistry at the Federal Institute of Materials Research and Testing in, Germ in Berlin, Germany, and is a lecturer at the Department of Chemistry Humboldt University in Berlin. She received her master's in chemistry from the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg in 2001, her PhD in chemistry from the same university in 2004, and her habilitation from the Humboldt University in 2018. Dr. Emmerling, Emmerling's research focuses on the design, synthesis, and characterization of novel materials with particular emphasis on their applications in green energy and catalysis. Dr. Emmerling has made significant contributions to the development of mechanochemical synthesis methods for a wide range of materials. Her expertise extends to the development and use of synchrotron-based X-ray techniques, including diffraction and spectroscopy, to characterize materials and observe structural changes in situ. Dr. Emmerling is a recognized expert in materials chemistry and mechanochemistry and serves as a reviewer for prestigious journals, including Science, Nature Communications, and Nature Communications. With a strong record of mentorship, Dr. Emmerling has guided the research of numerous postdoctoral researchers and PhD, master's, and bachelor's students, leaving a lasting impact on the field of chemistry. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Emmerling to the mechanochemistry discussions. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks a lot to the CMCC crowd for having me and I'm really happy uh, to provide you some insights in our real-time investigation on mechanochemistry. So um, I'm from the Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing. Oh, that should work. Let me see. Of course it doesn't. And um, that is just a sunny view of uh, my workplace. So you can see here and that's our institute and that's the Humboldt University where I do my teaching and there's another important thing in that picture and that is the synchrotron which is really right around the corner so everything in my life is in work and distance which is quite nice for most of the research we are doing. So everything is somehow wrapped around in situ methods so we are trying to understand processes using different uh, techniques, so crystallization processes, but of course, most prominently in the last years, we are looking into mechanochemical processes. And then we are dealing with uh, things like co-crystals, but also polymorphism and crystal engineering. And we are looking into uh, coordination polymers, trying to understand how MOFs are formed and so on, and also nanoparticles, but this I won't cover today. So I think in the mechanochemical community, I don't need much motivation why we are interested in mechanochemistry, but nevertheless, I, I like to show that slide where UPAC found out that mechanochemistry is really cool stuff back in 2019 and stating maybe the two most prominent reasons why I'm interested in that field, because we can get new things, new compounds that are not possible on different ways or the conventional or traditional synthesis. And scientists are still struggling to understand how that these processes work on a molecular scale, so there's still enough to learn. And that's always interesting, of course, for, for the scientific community. So usually we try to, to compare it to something we know, so conventional synthesis uh, working in, in liquids and flasks and vessels and so on, and then we transfer it 
um, to, to uh, mortars or ball mills. And then we have these two opportunities to get stuff faster in a simpler way and also see new compounds we don't see usually. And at the nice side aspect, we get rid of solvents and then, of course, uh, reducing the, the environmental impact of our synthesis. And that is something uh, a EU, pro EU project I'm working in is interested. And we are actually just meeting now in Lisbon. That's why I'm not streaming from uh, Berlin. And here we are looking into making uh, pharmaceutical industry a bit greener and cleaner. And that is uh, also with the use of um, mechanochemistry. So, but to be honest, if you think about mechanochemistry and where we are, you can see we are somewhere, we have a goal, we want to understand it, we want to use this as broad as possible, we want to have new mechanochemists around, and that is somehow a big goal, and it's somehow not so clear where we are. Are we somewhere there, or is the maybe this hill even farther away and maybe also steeper than I was able to draw it? So there's some panic mode, of course, and then you could leave the field, but you know we are uh, equipped, not just me and my group, but the many scientists around, and it's really a collaborative effort. So it's really great to see the many international friends around that we meet from time to time at conferences and discuss and compare notes and try to, to enrich the field somehow. So if you're just starting with mechanochemistry, just to use another picture and to convince you that I'm really a bad artist, so you can be an absolute beginner. You have no idea about um, what's going on in the field of mechanochemistry, or you have some ideas what's going on, or you are a know-it-all. So actually, I think all of us, we are somehow in between this field, and we need the, the input and, and ideas from many colleagues around to, to really um, get going. So the input of other researchers is highly recommended. And then we can go from someone who has still to look at what he or she is doing to someone who is fluent and an expert in the field. Okay, um, so we are all warmed up for our mechanochemistry session. And usually I like to show these slides. You know, we also always like to show our toys and tools. So um, below you can see what we usually use. So it's a bit in the area of, um, oh, let me get that pointer going. So we have, of course, motor and pestle, but we also use uh, vibratory mills and planetary mills. Also resonant acoustic mixing is a thing we do in our lab and of course extrusion. But basically what we do looks similar in all these labs. We have solid compounds, we use mills, and then we try to get a new product. And we usually see something like this. And on a reaction coordinate, we have an induction period, then a period where the reaction happens, and then uh, we get some products. And usually we try to compare notes here at the end, what's the outcome of our reaction, but this interesting bit here, the reaction period, it's that what we want to focus in in this talk. And the materials we are looking at, you can see here a list. It's not uh, a complete list, but you can see most of the interesting stuff uh, is covered already by mechanochemistry. I have a biased slide here um, to, to compare solvent and mechanochemical methods again. And you can see what we usually claim is that we can do stuff at room temperature. We can do it a bit faster. It's cost effective. It's, of course, environmentally friendly, but there are also some, let's say, drawbacks. Usually you get powders when you mill stuff and or you encounter amorphization, and there's still the lack of a, a precise control what's actually happening. And that brings us to an interesting or interesting fields of research. You have to do your structure solution. If you are like come with a crystallographic background, you have to do your structure solution from powder data, which can be a bit tedious, but also nice if it works out in the end and for getting control um, we need um, to apply different methods and and ultimately gaining control is the first step in uh, getting uh, the processes scaled up and also have some ideas how to reproduce our findings so if we think about the different mills i showed before you all know that we have different um, conditions, so it strongly depends on the type of mill you use, the type of vessels, the type of faults, the number of faults, and so on, but also the environment. So whether we do it in a neat grinding version, so without any solvents, or if we add some uh, liquids or other um, materials, so that all has an influence on um, what's going on, and that makes 
things a bit more difficult. So um, my group has um, been doing some research in, in this field, what I call parameter research to check uh, the influences of, of different uh, um, things like ball sizes and so on, but also the influence of different liquids on the, on the outcome of, for instance, polymorphic reaction. And in the past, and also more recently, we are also focusing on the aspect of, of temperature and temperature changes in the mill and, and the uh, influence on the, on the outcome of these reactions. Okay. So with that, let's let's dive into uh, in situ investigations of um, mechanochemical re reactions. What is um, the benefit of, of this type of investigation? You can see here on that slide uh, what you do usually in ex situ monitoring. So you have some reaction and then you take samples at different points in time. And the, the big advantage, of course, is you can you can use any method available in your lab and you can use many analytical uh, methods. Of course, you're a bit suffering from time resolution and also you disturb your process because you're opening stuff, things can evaporate, you change the conditions and that might also alter your product. If you monitor in situ, um, you get the uh, time resolution you would like to have for understanding what's really going on. Your processes are not disturbed, but you are limited again in, in the number of um, analytical techniques you can use. So if you compare it, it's like having a full deck of cards in the one case and a certain selection in the other case, and you have to choose those uh, wisely. Um, this is a, um, a recent, oh sorry, where is it? A recent review article uh, where we um, highlighted the, the benefits of in situ um, investigations. So as I said, we want to have uh, control and also um, want to gain um, uh, the, the possibility to, to scale up our processes and also to reproduce them. And that means you need a few uh, methods and you have to collect data to, to know more about the mechanism and also the kinetics uh, behind these reactions. So and here's my slide uh, showing again the picture I showed at the beginning. You can see our reaction going on, and we are interested in this blue part, what's really going on when we have the reaction on a, on a molecular level. And you can see some methods can help here. X-ray diffraction, very prominent in that case, but also X-ray adsorption spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy was used also NMR, not only by us, but also by other colleagues. Kasten Bollem in Aachen has now a really nice setup in place. And there are other methods where we not don't do not probe the structure itself, but we probe um, indirectly what's happening during a mechanochemical process. So here on the right, you can see some of the reactions that have already been introduced by, by different groups. And uh, we really benefit from a broad community coming up with new ideas and also trying techniques, even though you sometimes are in danger of ruining, ruining um, let's say, expensive detectors and so on, so we are brave enough to test it from, from time to time. This is how um, our little setup looks like, and you saw the synchrotron at the beginning, so it's very convenient for us that we can improve upon our existing setup um, during time, and you see here that it's a little um, mill, and we used these uh, eggs, we call them, like they, they are usually made of stainless steel, but in our case, it's perspex, so we can shine a laser through and we made some developments towards this setup, like we use it now, where we um, use thinner, thinner walls um, just to have less contribution of the perspex to our uh, data. So that's the sketch, and this is how the milling then looks like. You can see, as you know all, a bit of a movement around. It's uh, tricky to, to focus your beams on the correct spot. It's also tricky if you add stuff to this mill. Um, but um, yeah, we were happy or lucky enough that that worked quite well. You see here on the right side, you see our typical uh, setup in the synchrotron. It looks always a bit messy, but you can here see our little mill and you see the different um, also a safety prerequisite. We have a captain shield to make sure that the vessel doesn't hit the detector at some point. And you see here some selected uh, contributions where we could improve um, these in situ techniques. Here you see an example of a, of a tannery co-crystal. It's um, made of, from isonicotinamide, uh, perazinamide, and clotaric acid. And we already knew from experiments in the lab that we can either 
mill everything together and get our ternary product um, shown down here. Or we can mill two things together and add the third, and we end up with this ternary um, compound. So, and the question here was really, is it um, what's happening during this process? Do we have a direct formation of the ternary product or are they in between binary compounds? So what happens when we use this way uh, here, number three, for our reaction? We, as I said at the beginning, we are also interested in understanding the influence of, of different um, milling parameters. And here we were interested in the milling frequency. What I show now is uh, X-ray data. Um, in a top view. So these are uh, different X-ray diffraction patterns collected during a milling time of 14, 40 minutes. And you see here different areas and uh, different things happening throughout the process. At the beginning, we have our reactants. You can see here the traces. And then we see um, here shown in, in red, we see the formation of the product, which is the only phase we en end up here with. So the ternary co-crystal. But in between, you can see that with this little line here that belongs to the binary compound, we see the formation of a binary uh, co-crystal. Here is the Raman data is shown. So that is not uh, differentiating between binary and ternary compounds, but we can nevertheless see that we have um, some formation of a um, multinary uh, co-crystal. Okay, if we change our milling frequency from the 40 hertz we used here to 50 hertz, you can see that it, the picture changes. So um, we no longer observe this binary compound, so the green one, but we have a direct uh, conversion of our starting materials to the final product. So what's happening here? So if you think about it, what we do with a lower frequency, we have lower um, mixing um, possibility. And also if the starting materials get consumed, there is, let's say, less probability that three partners would meet to form a new compound. And then therefore, we assume that we have in between the formation of the binary product, which is not necessary for the formation of the ternary one, as we can see in the higher frequency uh, example, because this one is uh, uh, going directly to, to completion without this binary step. Okay, uh, another co-crystal example I will show on the next slides. And here we were a bit more interested in, in the effects that temperature could have on the milling process. You can see we skipped uh, pyrazinamide, so it's only glutaric acid and isonicotinamide in that case. We uh, know, knew the existence of the form one, but you know these co-crystals they like to form um, polymorphs. So there is a second form that you can only obtain uh, uh, under neat grinding conditions. And as I said, um, if, you, if you come up with a new structure, you need to solve it from powder diffraction data. And that was uh, possible here. You see the Wheatfeld refinement, and then we could assign this structure. So, and we were interesting now whether we can control the polymorphism um, by controlling the temperature in the ball mill. So before we started that, we had uh, a closer look at what's actually ha happening when we need grind the starting materials. Here you see the data for 50 hertz and for lower frequencies, in this case, uh, 35 hertz. And in both cases, we had a conversion to form, form two. Uh, and you can see that we also end up more or less here, um, shown down here with the same crystallite size, round about 40 nanometers. It takes a bit longer in uh, if you use lower frequency, but nevertheless, we never observe uh, another um, form in this case. Then we did um, variable temperature X-ray diffraction measurements to see what's happening. If I start with form one and heat it up, you see here the data, then more or less uh, nothing happens. So that is still form one and there's no conversion. But if we start with form two and heat it up, you can see that here at 363K, we have the conversion to form one. We then also performed slurry experiments to, to see which one is the thermodynamically stable product. And you can see here, uh, that's also um, uh, form, when we start with form one, we have no conversion. So this is um, the stable form here. 
Then we did our um, temperature measurements. You see here the milling vessel we used before, but now it's in a little uh, jacket, um, a heating jacket, so where we can apply temperature and keep the temperature at a certain level. So also any temperature changes within the reaction would be uh, counterbalanced here by this um, heating uh, setup. You can also see the um, changes in temperature we observe depending on the frequency. It's not that much. If sometimes uh, people assume that we have high temperature changes during milling in, in case of these soft materials, it's a difference of, of a delta T of maybe um, 10 um, K. So it's not really that different. So, and here you see the data uh, for, for room temperature, as, a, as we already know, we end up with this form two for both um, frequencies. There is also no intermediate formation of another form, but if we heat now to 353K, that is 10K below the um, uh, transition point with, we saw in the variable temperature measurement, you can see that we have the formation of form one. So based on that data, we uh, could find out with other measurements that there seems to be an upper and lower barrier where we can um, decisively produce uh, one or the other polymorph um, just by tuning in uh, temperature. So not only the milling energy, but also, um, let's say, kicking it over the hill with adding a bit uh, more temperature. And there's an in-between area where the outcome of uh, the polymorphism is more or less uh, stochastic, which is also clear if we have like very um, close um, energy um, barriers for, for both polymorphs. Okay, so um, we switch uh, gears a bit and look at the uh, uh, CC bond formation. So we did um, quite some uh, time, spent quite some time looking into the so called Knövenagel condensation. And uh, here you see the, the reaction we were looking at, that's nitrobenzaldehyde and malonitrile. So you have to mill it for around about um, 60 minutes at 50 hertz, and then you end up with this compound. And here you see again the X-ray diffraction data. Uh, we only see um, the, the aldehyde because malonitrile is a liquid at uh, an early stage here in this, or, or melts at an early stage in the reaction. And you see we need around about 50 minutes for a full conversion. So the um, X-ray data is a, looks a bit boring, but in Raman you can clearly see that we are um, losing here the, the contribution of the aldehyde group here. Uh, during the process, the CC bond is formed here in blue, and we see the shift of our nitrile group from um, starting material to, to product. Okay, that was a, a nice uh, setup. And then we thought, okay, if we can add two methods, you can add another one. And here we added uh, thermography. So we also get a temperature information of our vessel monitoring the temperature uh, during the reaction. And here you see more or less the same data I showed before, just now tilted by 90 degree. So this is our diffraction pattern. And um, you can see now, um, if you follow this temperature curve, that's the, the gray curve here, we have a, a decrease in temperature at the beginning, we reach a, a plateau. And then you see here, in, if you look in the diffraction data, you see that the intensity of the reflections decreases and we start to form the product. And here in this blue area where the product formation sets in temperature rises a bit and then goes down again to the plateau we saw before. So you can see here in this example, that the heat of formation really contributes to the, the temperature within the mill and that it's not the, the, the coalition with the balls and, and the uh, milling walls that um, is here uh, gives rise to this temperature, but, but actually the heat um, of formation. Okay, so we then went on looking at, at different uh, Knövenagel um, condensations, looking at differently fluorinated uh, aldehydes, these are interesting because those guys are all liquid. Uh, so, but nevertheless, it's also possible to monitor that reaction. And we also got a, a new compound that was not uh, described before. Um, and we could actually isolate um, a single crystal uh, material and, and measure it uh, uh, directly from, from the milling vessel. 
And here in a, in a recent study, we went back to the first example I showed you using the nitrobenzaldehyde and malononitrile. And we were looking at, uh, in, at um, using liquid assisted grinding reactions and also were interested uh, uh, to know more about the influence of the solvents and, and the polarity of the solvents. And here you see the data for different solvents, ethanol, DMF, and also neat grinding, and the non-polar solvent here we use octane. And under the, if you use polar solvents, we have a, a more or less a direct conversion to our final product. If we use neat grinding or the non-polar solvent, we get an intermediate. So you see here the green lines, we form um, in, that it's the starting materials, and here in, in the intermediate phase, we have the hydroxyl uh, compound. So we then uh, try to trap uh, this intermediate, and this is possible if you know the, the, the process, then you can stop at a certain time and try to isolate it. And that what we have done here, you see after 60 minutes, we have the pure or more or less pure intermediate, and then you can solve again the crystal structure from powder data and uh, yeah, can assign this uh, crystal structure. And then we um, try to understand how these reaction proceed. We could monitor that um, using Raman spectroscopy, looking at the different uh, bands. Here you see the CO stretching band, which um, vanishes during the process. It takes more time for the knee grinding conditions and also using the non-polar solvent. And you can see here in the DMF, the process is rather fast. Then we also monitored in which cases we observe the intermediate. And as we already saw before, that's for the knee grinding and the unpolar solvent. Whereas in case of um, DMF and ethanol, we um, nearly we, we did not observe any formation of an intermediate. And then we can see also that during the, the time span, uh, we were not able here in, in case of the knee ground version or um, using octane, we were not able to reach a final plateau. So it takes longer for the conversion because we have this intermediate uh, formation in the first place. So we also monitored that process um, with X-ray diffraction. Here you see the same picture. That's a direct conversion in case of ethanol. And here in when we use octane, we have the um, concomital formation of, of the intermediate and the final product. We also then analyzed the data um, a bit in more detail in using exito um, data and Riedfeld refinement. And you see again, here we have the complete formation of the product in case of ethanol. And here uh, using octane, we stop um, at a certain conversion or if the conversion is not complete uh, within the time frame of 60 minutes. Okay, and we are leaving uh, for now uh, the uh, X-ray data and we are looking a bit at the possibilities of scaling up. So there's some, there are many groups out there looking at that. Um, so Debbie Crawford, for instance, and Stuart James did beautiful work in this regard, um, trying to use extrusion. And we are also looking in 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 this field, um, starting with a with a prominent um, MOF in this case. So that's SIF eight. It's something like a poster boy for for the MOF materials. You know they have these funny names because. Uh, the acronym refers to the fact that we have a very similar angle that we would also observe in zeolites. So this SEO, SE angle is closely to the metal emitter, so metal angle we can observe in, in these uh, ZIFs. And here you see the original article um, by Omayagi and colleagues, and you can see that's a normal reaction time, around about 30 um, hours. They use DMF and the yield was about 25%. We, we and other colleagues also looked into the mechanochemical um, process to for forming this CIF-8 uh, compound. And you can see here that can be done much faster. So within 10 minutes, you have a, a conversion and 100% yield. So we use here a basic zinc carbonate that's a bit different from the recipe Omayagi and colleagues were using. They use the nitrate, but nevertheless, um, you get your pure compound and you can also avoid uh, to an, uh, um, a great degree the use of, of any solvents. 
So that's fine. But um, then I had a new, new um, PhD student and he was preparing samples uh, to, to do some measurements. And he realized that you don't have to mill at all. So that you don't need really to, to grind the, the material before. You can also just mix the, um, the ingredients and wait. And that's what he did here. You can see again, we have the linker material and the zinc carbonate, and he just waited a bit and um, got the, the final product in the end just by, by waiting. You can see it. you need a certain time uh, um, for the conversion here around, uh, let's say, 16 hours. Then you get the, the traces of SIF-8. So if you look at the position of the reflections, they agree. The intensities do not agree. That has to do a bit with the leftover material still uh, stuck in, in the pores. But after some activation step, you end up with a with a uh, neat uh, SIF-8 pattern. If you wait too long, then you see the formation of a side product. So the little stars here, that is because we are producing a bit of uh, CO2 and that reacts further with the, uh, with the linkers. Again, we were interested what's what's going on and we performed uh, here in this case, um, Raman in situ measurements. Uh, before, of course, we, we checked our um, material X situ. You can see here, ZIF-8, that's a commercial material and that's our product. Not so super in this case when it comes to absorption, but also doing fine. And here are the SEM data. I'll come to those in a bit. And then we looked at uh, the, the Raman spectra. And you can see here, these are spectra um, taking um, every 15 minutes. So we took a Raman spectrum. And you can see here that um, we can see how the, the product is formed here in, in the, the red uh, line. And um, it is clear, so we don't get a full conversion, but somehow we end up with a um, OK amount of product. We, we then looked more closely into the process. And you can see here what happens if you don't shake the vessel at all, just mix it and, and let it rest. So you can see we end up with a conversion of around about 50%. If you shake at the beginning, then you can see that the conversion is faster and reaches around about 60%. And it gets even better and when you add a bit of water to the process. You see the data here. If you add water and let it rest, then you, we end up with something like 77% um, uh, conversion. And here, if we um, add water and mix it, then you have a faster process also leading uh, to conversion about 77%. And this is uh, the mechanism we are suggesting in that case. So we start with our zinc carbonate. There is um, also um, water released during the reaction, and that dissolves our linker. And then we have a growing um, MOF material uh, by reducing our zinc carbonate. And that's also the reason why we saw these white spots. So there's still some leftover material. So that was a, for us a nice reaction. Then we wanted to see whether we can use this exact reaction for upscaling. And that's the basic idea. So we want to, to go from the vessel system to a continuous process. And we use here our extruder. To um, make it, so to, to, to monitor the process, we needed some PMMA windows to shine our laser through. And you can see here first data. So it works quite nicely. Um, we have the, the extra date directly. And then after washing, it looks already uh, like uh, the commercial CIF-8. So that was uh, promising. And then we went on with our in situ investigation. And you see what, what we checked here. So first of all, we checked whether we need the whole barrel length or if we can shorten our um, barrels a bit and, and have a, a conversion already. And see, you hear, see here different parameters we tested, temperature, changing in feeding rates, and also looking at the, the liquid we use. And the little crown guide, guides you a bit um, where we try to find op optimal conditions. In the next step, we change liquid from um, water to ethanol, and you can see it's now even um, better. And we also found some ideas on, on uh, the feeding rate. And then we um, experimented a bit more with a um, linker to metal ratio and then found the optimal conditions. And you see here the final product. So that is uh, in black again, the commercial one and in blue our uh, product. So, and that is 
uh, really um, a good comparison. And, and now we have a process where we can produce up to three uh, kilograms um, per day, which is quite good for scaling up from a milligram uh, process. Okay. But as I said at the beginning, it's also mechanochemistry also always claims to be the green method, and we should also be able to prove that. And therefore, we come up with these radar charts, checking the different synthesis techniques that are out there for, for ZIF-8. There is around about uh, 30 different types of um, uh, ways, or you can synthesize ZIF-8, and you see here a comparison, and you can also see the parameters we look for. So we wanted to have a fast reaction. We wanted to use less solvent as possible, uh, small amounts of solvent. We wanted to have a high surface area and so on. And then you can see here, um, this is um, the, the chart for, for our process, but we can also compare it to others where we have um, solvent reaction, but also other extrusion reaction or ball milling. And in this case, of course, you might have guessed it, our process is as by far um, the, the environmental friendliest one and also the one that reaches the, the highest um, surface area. Okay, so coming back to our little hill, where are we? So I'm, I'm thinking we are somewhere there. We still need um, to talk to, to many others to convince them about the beauty and, and the benefits of using mechanochemistry. We also need to convince those sticking to the, the vessels and vials. And of course, we need the whole community and, and people who, who talk about mechanochemistry to, to get this um, community growing and then um, also um, using uh, different areas. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware already sure that mechanochemistry is a green and efficient method. Um, you can have maybe seen now that uh, in situ methods are really um, key for um, understanding processes and then also having uh, the chance uh, to scale processes up. We still need a lot more knowledge about um, what's going on during mechanochemical reactions to actually control them in the end. But I'm pretty sure the community will come up with new methods and also um, maybe some new protocols, how to treat the data. And then we, at the end, we will unleash uh, the, the full potential of that method. Yeah, with that, I would like to acknowledge a few, just a few colleagues. You see parts of my crew, but our uh, summer trip um, and also dear colleagues who, who um, had a tremendous contribution to what's happening. So that's Adam. I think he was also uh, in in the meeting a, a few uh, weeks before. And that's my dear colleague, uh, Biswajit, who is responsible for many of, of the, the MOF materials. And these are PhD students and other collaborators. And of course, I have to thank my impactive friends for letting me out of the meeting for an hour to talk to you. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. All right. Thank you very much. We have several questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, have you ever analyzed the effect of adding inert additives to the kinetics of these reactions? Yes, we did uh, investigations with SEO2 added to the reactions. And um, in this case, so that the idea was to see whether the ball to reactant ratio has an influence. Um, so in, in this case, it was an inert, um, uh, let's say material, nothing uh, really happened with the material, um, but um, maybe adding on that, we know from, from many um, experiments that, um, one has to be super careful to call something inert because oftentimes you have a, a reaction, maybe also with impurities you are not aware of, and then the thing can go in a whole different um, direction. All right, thank you. Uh, earlier in the presentation regarding the temperature difference you saw at different frequencies, is it possible that the delta T is larger if you were able to measure temperature at the contact between the ball and the walls, for example? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that the, there is a, a um, high temperature um, in the moment when the 
balls meet and and also uh, let's say locally and for a short amount of time we might we, we are let's say pretty sure that we have a larger um uh, or we, we observe higher temperatures but it's really difficult to measure i'm aware of the the possibilities um certain uh, ball mill manufacturers provide um, but it's still an information of the the vessel inside and not really at the at the contact point of the walls. Well, here's a perhaps related question. Then another question is: Does thermography verify your bulk jar temperature control setup? Actually, I didn't get that one. Can you can you repeat it? Does thermography verify your bulk jar temperature control setup? Yes, it does. So, um, <laughs> so that's a short answer to that Very. question. Yeah, we did. It's it's okay. I have to say it's it's really tricky to measure. You have seen you have only a, a, a tiny window to do the measurements, but but we did that as a control, and and it, it confirms um, the delta T. Great. All right. Um, on slide twenty seven, you talked about the fact that certain solvents enable the formation of an intermediate before conversion to the product. Does the need to form an inter intermediate correlate to slowing down the reaction or does it speed it up? Is there something we could infer from these results to other lag-based syntheses? Maybe I go back to slide 27. Ah. Okay, in this case, so um, we have a, a, a real, uh, let's say it's a, it's a chemical reaction we are observing. And here really um, we have a two-step process. So you you have in in let's say the second step would be the elimination reaction, and we know that um, uh, um, unpolar solvents or in under neat grinding conditions they would not really um, enhance that step, but the the polar solvents would, and therefore it's it's clear that for the um, for ethanol and DMF the reaction is faster. Um, but that has to do with the with the chemistry we are looking at. So we also know uh, from from co-crystal systems, for instance, that it there seems to be a, a tendency for the uh, for neat grinding and also grinding with non-polar solvents to prefer the kinet kinetically controlled product. So not only our work but also work of colleagues has shown that there seems to be a, a preference. Um, and and then. Um, it does not, but it does not necessarily um, um, make the reaction slower. So if you add a solvent, usually uh, the the um, let's say the reaction or the reaction proceeds faster. But if you, for instance, refer to non-polar solvents, it can also be in in the same range. So of course now this in this particular reaction uh, here, this slide is slower because we have this intermediate formed and then it takes more time because the solvent doesn't doesn't help in that case. All right, let's have one I have one comment here and then one last question. So regarding slide 31, I'm just thrilled. I think this is the first use of the reaction box diagrams to convey these reactions to others and this is an excellent idea. <laughs> so just a comment on slide positive comment on slide. We have a fan, yeah. That's, <laughs> Indeed. So I, actually, I can maybe I can ha yeah, have a please. comment on that one. Please, please. So it, it's super difficult for us mechanochemists to see at a at a at a glimpse what's actually going on, you know. And and this is a suggestion um, we came up in in uh, in the context of our cost network on mechanochemistry, where we said, okay, it would be nice if we have a little cartoon telling everything. And and this is a actually a way of of um, showing that, but it needs to be used more. So otherwise, it doesn't help. <laughs> All right. On that very positive note, I would say let's wrap up. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerling, for that outstanding presentation, and thank you so much for joining us. A reminder that all of our previous seminar speakers are available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel, and I encourage you to check them out. Also, we have a couple great speakers planned for the upcoming months, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Thank you again.